Fun 2019 Saturday attendees. How we doing? Oh, we got a we got a small but a feisty group. All right, all right, all right. Well, y'all know what I got in this bag, right? All right, it's the first panel, so we got to get our energy up and everything else. So, how's everybody doing today? Absolutely outstanding. Okay, what we're going to do, we're doing right here, this is going to be called a VA Voice Acting 101, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a sort of a, a conversation and uh, with our wonderful guests and kind of talk about some of the mechanics, how they got into it, and you're going to see some generational perspectives, and the main purpose of this is that what we're going to do is, is try to give you guys some insight into where voice acting was, where it is today, and where they think it might be going for anybody who wants to either pursue a career in it or just interested in general. So, what I'll do is, is that we'll have a little talk for a little a little bit, and then I'll open it up to your questions. We'll put a microphone right up here. I'll go over some of the rules with that way, but because this is a voice acting panel, what I do request is, is think of your questions relating to the art and the techniques or whatever related to voice acting. If you wanted to ask the mechanical question about the characters, you know, you want to ask them about Dragon Ball or episode 27 of Justice League, Go ahead and do that at their tables downstairs, and uh, which I'm sure you've all been doing is you buy a picture and an autograph from them. So, with that being said, y'all ready? Please, put your hands together for our first guest. He is a radio veteran uh, and, and started out in uh, THX 1138, one of the other George Lucas films. Uh, he is known as the creator of the term Wookiee. Uh, today we'll be talking about his work on DuckTales, a Dartwing Duck. And of course, he's been doing like commercials and video games and many other things. Please welcome it up for Mr. Awesome Terry McGovern. Thank you, thank you. Whoa. Whoa. Hey. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Next, ladies and gentlemen, with, from an illustrious television career. Also, if any 80s fans out there may remember him from an awesome cartoon called Pirates of Dark Water. Any fans of that? Yes! All right, my people are in the house. Okay, amazing TV work on Chicago Hope. He has been the voice of Superman in the Timverse of the Warner Brothers like cartoons uh, for many, many years. Video games, and so much more. We're going to talk about it. Please put your hands together for Mr. George Newburn. Hello. Thank you. I'll do, I'll do you one better. Whoop, what the fuck was that? Oh, oh, oh no! hey. How you doing? We got an actor down. I had to do it. I did a double trip. It's a we, trip and a look. Yeah, we, we, we can't pay a stunt pay. I'm sorry. All right. Sorry. All right. We'll give it to you. And last, You're ladies welcome. and gentlemen, uh, our next guest, well, you know, this, if you ever... You know who he is. You know who he is. You know who he is. He's Mr. Satan himself and a bunch of other things. Please give it up for Mr. Chris Rager! Yeah! Thank you for not tripping. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I would have taken this whole stage down if I had done the press ball. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to Miami. Welcome. Uh, hope you're having a good stay with us. Yeah, yeah, nice weather. Delicious. <laughs> Thick. You're, you're dressed for <laughs> yeah. it. I'm not. That's why I have to change on How do you all live in this humidity? Air conditioning. Air con. Ask a stupid question. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love the city. It's gorgeous. It's, I mean, there's so much... Color and you know San Francisco's a little odd, but you guys take the prize. I mean, it's just wow the, the best. Clothing optional apparently here. Clothing optional apparently here in Miami. Clothing optional. Yeah. That's a nice feature yeah. too. <laughs> Sometimes it's added bonus. <laughs> Indeed. What I'd love to do is uh, open up. I'd like to ask first individually how you uh, fell into what you would consider falling into voice acting, and what point you were at your career, and then what led to it. And yeah. I'd love to start with you, sir. There was no falling. I mean, I, if you're already established a star, and then you discover voice, so I remember Martin Sheen, my wife was a business manager at a talent agency 
in uh, Los Angeles, and I did a movie with Martin Sheen, and he discovered that I did commercials, and on camera and voiceover. He said, this is Martin Sheen. How can I get into that? <laughs> and I said, well, I think it would be pretty easy, Martin. <laughs> Call my wife, and uh, she'll make an appointment to, for you at the agency. And within about a month, he was doing Nissan or, or what, some car, and he continued to do it for years and years. No, I never got any, uh, any pay on it. Uh, no commission. <laughs> but I didn't stumble. I knew that I wanted to be an actor. And I think that's something that most people don't get the word on. And let me give it to you. This is a job, whether you call it voiceovers or whatever you want to call it, it's a job for an actor. That doesn't mean you're excluded because you don't have a card, a membership card. No, it's are you or are you not an experienced actor? Have you done plays? Have you, you, know, have you worked on your craft as an actor? Because that's what you bring to the microphone. Uh, that's basically what it is. Even if it's a commercial, uh, sometimes the, the most difficult acting jobs are doing commercials. But, you know, to be able to assume this is your role, this is your character, whether it's an announcer or a, a, a little uh, gecko, whatever it might be, those are all actors. I, I've never met anybody who said, I'm a heart surgeon, I gotta get back as soon as I, you know, make this commercial. Uh, people are full-time actors for the most part. And so I worked very hard at that. And my father had also been in radio when I was a kid. He went to school on the GI Bill, so I was old enough to witness what he was doing. And I loved it. I don't know, there's something about walking into a radio station or a recording studio when you're a kid. It's really sexy. Even though as a kid, you don't know what sexy means. <laughs> But th there's just something uh, this, wonderful. I don't in, like where in, this is going. I don't know uh, yeah. <laughs> in, exception in, in George's case. But there's just something really cool, you know? It's, it's sort of alien at first, and there's all these equ equipment and lights and dials and things. So I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker at about 10. And I've been doing it ever since. And all that radio stuff. And oh, uh, I worked on radio yeah. for, for years, and that was the best thing that could have happened. I mean, I loved being on radio just by itself. And I had a, I had a good show, and, and, and we had great ratings, and uh, that was all fun. But in the course of it, every day, I had to read cold copy, or something would come in that I'd, I had to read. And man, there's no way like getting your chops, uh, uh, like doing the same thing every day. And you really get good at it. And uh, that, was, that was great training, and also good employment. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Excellent. So there too. Uh, how about you, young man? Um, where do you, because like I said, you had a, again, you had a standard acting background. Uh, no, no, well, yes. I, I grew up in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, so I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm this uh, weird anomaly person from Hollywood uh, who lives in Hollywood now. But, but I grew up in Little Rock doing plays uh, from 12 years old. I was um, to Children's Theater and um, wanted to be an actor, wanted just like, yeah. just like uh, he said. And um, I, I learned to be a dancer. I was a ballet dancer for about eight or nine years. And then um, we could a, tell. Sing, a singer. Yeah, no, 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 it's just a... Y'all missed old, him. He's yeah, really it's pretty It's just a bunch good. of bull crap. But uh, I, um, yeah, so I went to school to study theater at Northwestern in Chicago. And I was a singer and musical theater performer, both, mostly. <clears throat> and I thought I was going to go to New York and, look, if I was lucky, get a job as a you know, in the chorus of a musical, I just thought if I could if I could get paid three hundred and fifty dollars a week and dance in the background, I will have made it. This is amazing. I, I mean, you know, I just didn't have any idea what the whole universe was of any of it. And uh, I, when I was a junior in college, um, I auditioned for a movie downtown Chicago, and it was uh, this movie called Back to the Future. And I was like, Oh, what is this? This is really kind of a good script. This reads well. And I. <laughs> The next day, I got a call to go screen test for it, and they flew me to um, Los Angeles, and I screen tested. I was down to the last three guys. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Clearly, I didn't get it. <clears throat> but um, uh, I was down to the last three guys, and I met Spielberg, and everybody else had been cast, and I, I got on you know, Zemeckis. Everybody was there, and, and um, it was right before Eric Stoltz got the part. And right then, I kind of thought, Oh shit! This is a real. This is a real. There's so much more than maybe dancing in the background. I I gotta maybe come do this. Um, so anyway, long story short, I didn't get it. It was an amazing experience. But um, when I came to LA, my first 
job, or sec my second job was actually Pirates of Dark Water, a cartoon that, that Jody Benson and I did and Tim Curry. Um, but I was mostly doing on-camera stuff. And just throughout the last 25 years in Hollywood, I would occasionally do an on-camera th uh, on camera thing and then an animation thing. So it's sort of been interspersed throughout. Um, um, and then I did a video game called uh, the video game character Sephiroth for Final Fantasy. And I didn't know that that was going to turn out to be as big as it is. Like, it's huge. Uh, and, um, but uh, again, it's so weird. These, these, the video things, the video games and the animation stuff has sort of lasted longer than any of the on-camera things I've done, although they have been, yeah. you know, made more money kind of doing the other things. I've made a good living. But the, but the, the shelf life of the, of the animation this thing is so amazing. And these cons are so incredibly gratifying to come to, I must say. But um, anyway, I, I could yap a long time. You, you talk. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I too have uh, a uh, theater and acting background. Uh, I didn't do it through high school. I was in the band and, uh, and, and those kinds of things. But uh, when I went to college, I thought I was going to be some kind of artist or maybe a musician. And I was kind of going down that path. And one day I didn't have enough money for my, uh, my drawing two class. There was a lab fee. It was like 16 bucks. And I had budgeted all my money and I didn't have the 16 bucks. So I took an acting class instead. And well, let's just say I didn't take any more drawing classes or anything like that. I eventually got into improv very, very quickly. I found out that I had a knack for improv uh, and comedy, and it was something I already loved and enjoyed. I watched many, many comedians and, and SNL and Mad TV over the years, and just comedy was in my blood, you know. And uh, so from there, I went to an acting school, uh, <clears throat> met some of my good friends like Josh Martin, who's Majin Bu, and uh, we started a comedy troupe, so we started doing improv and sketch comedy and uh, performing anywhere and uh, 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 anywhere that would take us and eventually started to build a name for ourselves and started to get a reputation, traveled to LA, played the improv a few times, those kinds of things. And, uh, and then uh, in the process of that, this company called Funimation pops up in North Richland Hills, Texas, and they're paying people to do voices for cartoons. I'm like, well, I can do that. I want to do that. Yeah. So I went out one day and I booked a part in Dragon Ball Z and I've been doing voices ever since. But again, like, like Terry was saying, was it, it, it's an all-encompassing job. You know, you, you, need to, you need to be looking for theater work. You need to be looking for on-camera work. You need to be looking for voiceover work and, 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 act, and be actively out there. And it, it's putting yourself in this little world like, I just want to work in anime. You're not going to pay your bills. You're just not. No. Anime does not pay anything worth, well, maybe your electric bill. You might pay that a month. But it just doesn't pay enough. So you've really silenced the room. I that. have, right? Yeah. No, no. But you're, you're right. It's you all to... over. It's ending. Don't do this. Is... No. no, you just have to have a lot of arrow, you know a lot of arrows in your quiver. You gotta you gotta have a lot. Of... Yeah, you you gotta be multifaceted. And at the end of the day, you gotta be a hungry actor who's willing to work. You know, you gotta be looking for work. It's not about fame or fortune. It's it's about working and living and having a life. I well said, did he? As far as animation voice acting, you, uh, each of you has a particular, uh, particular single identified role that uh, you're, you're notorious for. Um, you told us pretty much how you got hooked up with, uh, with Funimation. I'd like to hear how you uh, got Superman. Um, uh, Tim Daly was busy, is yes. basically what happened. And um, I went and auditioned to say, oh, yeah, they're replacing Superman because he's new in this series. And I was like, well, okay, cool. I didn't give it two thoughts. It was yeah, just another just audition during the day. Yeah. And usually you don't get them. 98% you don't get. And uh, maybe more than 98%, yeah. almost all. So you just go. And you, you, just, you just go. You show up. You go. You go. You go. You, don't, you try not to think about it. You go. And, but I, I knew when I got this, I went to the first uh, sort of, they were always like, "Oh, this is this is iconic. This is this is this could be really big." And then I was nervous about getting fired, but that's usually that's just the way I am. So, yeah. <laughs> so we do. Uh, Darkwing Duck. Um, what was it? it started actually with Ducktales. Can I just yeah, do a quick yeah. uh, uh, mention here? Uh, George mentioned uh, he didn't get the part in uh, uh, Back to the Future. There is a worse fate. I auditioned for it and got a part. And the it was shot. I went over to the Alfred Hitchcock uh, studio, the biggest studio in L.A., and met Bob Zemeckis, who had just done Romancing the Stone. And one of the things he said, I will never do another movie outside. <laughs> because, remember the swamps and the mudslides and all that? So he was on this project, and, and the, a model of the town was on the table. I mean, was, this was a big deal. And Zemeckis said, okay, you're going to be one of the parents. You're going to be McFly's father, I think it was. 
No, no, uh, the bully's father. That was it. Whoever Biff's father? Huh? Biff. Biff's father. Okay. I was Biff's oh, wow. dad. Yeah. And so I, I was ecstatic. And, and uh, we go in and we shoot it. I think I worked a week on it. And, uh, hey, I'm in a major, a Bob Zemeckis film. This is incredible. Movie comes out. I'm not in it. Because Bob Zemeckis decided, why don't we have the kids play their, their own parents? And so all of, my, all, of the, all of us actors who had played the, the fathers were on done, the, on the cutting room excised floor. Yeah. on the floor. But one little piece of good news is every time there's an anniversary of that film, uh, I get a nice check because I still get paid. And if you look at the, you know, they have those little uh, odds and ends, little tidbit things that that they have, and my scene is there. I, I, I can see my scene. <laughs> and I walk in, there's Crispin Glover. Oh, and while I was on the set the first day, this little nervous guy comes up to me. Nice looking kid, you know, but even shorter than me. And I, I say, oh, this, I said, well, I know, you look familiar. He said, oh, I did a television show, the name of which I can't remember. Michael J. Fox's show was... Family Ties. Family Ties. And I said, gee, I never, I'm sorry, I've never seen it. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. And I said, so who are you playing? He says, I'm the lead. And I said, but you said it's your first day. And I know they've been shooting for a while. He said, well, they already had a guy, and they let him go. And that was Eric Stoltz. Eric Stoltz. He and the director did not get along. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that, that's the same case as in uh, Apocalypse Now. Uh, Martin Sheen was not the first Captain Willard. It was Mean Streets? Clue? No. Oh, Keitel. Harvey, Harvey Keitel. 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 Yeah. And he and uh, Francis didn't get along. So, so it doesn't matter how big you are. <laughs> you can be shown the door. And uh, yeah. uh, anyway, what was your question? Oh, DuckTales. <laughs> <laughs> Like, and when is he going to stop talking? No. This is a story I want you kids to listen to carefully, all right? This is like the safety lecture in high school. Uh, don't be afraid of being pushy. There's limits, but don't be afraid of, of standing up for yourself. One day, one hot day, I was living in Los Angeles. I drove from West L.A. to Burbank. A really a sucky drive. I mean, it takes forever. And I get to uh, this casting place, and I had one line, and it's delicious, or something like that. And I was really taking the heat, and I thought, geez, all the way over here. And then I noticed there's a stack of scripts, and it's uh, uh, Disney, A actors only, or A list, or something like that. So one of the things you want to do if you're going to become an actor is learn how to read upside down. <laughs> so you can sneak over on a script and read it. And I saw this character for Launchpad, and it, the, the, the description was, must sound like, and you're always, they always tell you to sound like something else or somebody else. And it was John Ratzenberger or Jack Burns. And Ratzenberger, you would know from Cheers. Cliffy, right. So I, could, I knew I could do that kind of a voice, and I called my agent, and he was reluctant at first to help me. I said, I'll hold my breath. I will never breathe again, and you'll, uh, you'll be your fault. So he called the guy, and he says, just re let him read, please. Okay. I was new in town. Nobody knew me. So in I go. I do the voice. And, uh, you know, Jack Burns was that guy. Huh? 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 Yeah, we had a good time, didn't we? Huh? Huh? <laughs> and, uh, and Ratzenberger's voice, I put a little of that in there, too. And the guy said, that's it. I've never had anybody say that to me in my life. Wow, cool. That's it. <laughs> And I got the part. Thank you. So speak up for yourselves. <laughs> There's something very much to be said about, yeah, fortune favors the bold. And absolutely, there, there is a weirdness to, well, I finally got an agent, so I'm set. And it's like, mm, no, way. no, you're all, you, you, you got to hustle. Yeah. You I always got to hustle. I, I can't tell you how many times that I have almost not gone to meetings and because you think, God, I've been in that office eight times and I don't get that job. And the show um, Scandal on ABC about what, six years ago, I got a call for Shonda Rhimes. I go, oh, man, I've been in that office so many times and I don't get one. I'm, I'm, just not, I'm not gonna go. And my wife goes, just go. It's gonna take, uh, just God go bless the wives. Minutes. And it's a guest spot. It was just a guest spot. It wasn't any kind of, so I went and, and I got the part and it ended up being you know seven years 
they made him a regular after you know a while, the character. And I was like, I almost did not go to that. That was, right. a, that, you know, and it's so easy because you get beat down, you get rejected all the time. People say, hey, you can't do this. There's too many people, and um, this is for all of you. Don't let anybody tell you not to do it. If you really, really want to do it, show up and go, and go, and then let the, let them say no, but don't say no to yourself before they say no. So that that was what. I, I was yeah, saying. if I could just add one thing to that, yeah. it's it's. I'm sorry. It's an expression. I, I teach acting, and I always have this one in my pocket. I always have this one in my pocket. I went down and I read for something, and I didn't get it. And because there's not that many auditions in San Francisco, you you can't be doing it every day, every day. And so these people get really depressed because they didn't get it. I say, look, it's not rejection. It's selection. These people have nothing against you. You don't, I mean, you're, it's not personal. And actors sometimes can't get that through their heads. Or they didn't like my nose, or they didn't, the way I was. Probably didn't even notice that. They wanted somebody. They had a, an idea, a picture in their mind, and somebody who might fit that picture is going to get selected. You're not being rejected. So it's kind of get over yourself and, and don't get into this business if you can't take being rejected, as, as George said. Yeah. I've always said that if you go, go every time you go to an audition, you're auditioning to be invited to come back and audition again. That's, that's what you want to do. And by yeah, the way, you, even you, when you get the job, you, 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 you still don't have yeah. a job because I've been fired right. several times for yes, jobs after getting it. So it doesn't. Right. But it's a whole bunch of until, until you're refusal. done and you've got the check. And, and so are these four other people. Totally. You don't. I mean, yeah, you don't get it. You don't. <laughs> you don't get it. Fine. You know what? Yeah. You you go on in there. You hit the mark. You make a good impression, and they'll remember you. This way. a lot of my parts I've gotten from something I did at a different audition six months beforehand. You know? Would well, you do this? You. Yeah, they will do that. You just want to go on in there and just if you don't have a fit, that's fine. As long as to make a choice. Make a good impression. That's I all would say do. there's a thousand reasons they didn't select you, and none of them are personal. And there's usually only one why they did, and it is. It's that image, that's that thing. That person knew what they wanted, and one day you walked in and you were it. And it's and also everyone else wasn't. It's also timing because they can right. they can find the right person or at at at, at the time early, and then the project gets put on hold for a couple of months, and then suddenly they go, you know what? We don't. It's like it's all timing, like relationships in life and jobs in life. It's all timing and just keep showing up because your time comes, I think. Disney used me as a measuring stick for 10 years. <laughs> I was, there, was, there was one specific role. Uh, it was called the uh, Captain Jack's Pirate Tutorial. They had me read for it eight times over 10 years. Wow. And the eighth time I finally said, this is it. And I finally got it out of casting that was just like, you're, you were, they said they were flattered. They said, you're the measuring stick. Anybody that we think does better than you, then we look at. Oh, great. Huh. I was, yeah, I, right. I was, it was just like, okay, you know, I was like, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> just okay. give me Don't the job, me. Yeah. man. Come on. Eventually they did, and then they, they closed the show. So I never even got it. I, got, I, did, I did a costume fitting. I did a makeup uh, test. Okay, we're good to go. Yeah, we're shutting it down. I'm like, uh. But that's showbiz. Yeah. <laughs> This is making me nauseous, <laughs> and I've done it. I let's do uh, let's do this, then we'll we'll open up to the questions. Um, I would love to hear uh, any any interesting stories from inside the booth, uh, good or bad uh, misadventures or moments or whatever. Inside the recording booth. Yes. Uh, and by the way, we're, you know, when you hear voiceovers, what does voiceover means? Oh, it mean it it basically is a TV term. It means your voice is heard over whatever the pictures are. But it's now become the generic term for voice work. And I've, I've done voiceovers, I've done uh, commercials on camera and just uh, radio commercials. I think the most important thing to do, my father fortunately was in advertising back in the Mad Men days. You know, the Lucky Strikes and martinis at lunch. And, uh, but he good old days. Huh? The good old yes. days, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But he, uh, you know, he, he made me aware of a lot of things. One, that he said, everybody thinks they can write a commercial. So you will find a lot of writers or producers in commercials are somewhat prickly, somewhat sensitive. And uh, I watched a guy destroy himself one day when he s started criticizing. He got the job, we're in the booth, and he's criticizing the writing. Well, don't you really mean to say? And it, they, they literally said, 
we're going to break for lunch. And I knew it. I knew he wouldn't be back. <laughs> and they did. They went and got somebody else and brought him back in. You're there, whether you're there to serve a commercial or to serve William Shakespeare, it doesn't matter. Your job is to serve the play, what's been given to you. Not to criticize it, not to amend it. Uh, if you don't like it, hit the highway. But you're there to serve, and it does two things for you. It makes you uh, it turn out a good product, and it makes you very desirable to be hired again. Yes, I, to add to that, I always tell students of mine through workshops I do is uh, act like someone people want to work with. Even if you're acting. <laughs> right. Even if, you, if you, even if your acting skills are bad, at least be someone who's easy and open-minded and, and ready to work, right, and listens and doesn't add when it's unnecessary and doesn't try to uh, take on uh, when it's unnecessary, you know. But uh, that's my... There's a lot to be said about efficiency. Yes. Especially in the booth. And yeah, fun well, and yeah. anime as well. You know, we, re we really are cranking out the anime these days. We got about 10 booths running and, and whatnot. And so as you're kind of hopping around and everything and you want to be a part of these things, you know, you got to be willing to, you know, show up, show off, shut up and go home. You know, I mean, that's it. You know, and that's really it. Fun in the process. Yeah. I, I'm the oldest guy by far up here. And, and maybe in the microphone. Room. Huh? Your Mic microphone. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's why you can tell you're so old. See, remember how good microphone microphone skills are. <laughs> Back in the kerosene turntable days. How's the voiceover panel? Couldn't hear a thing. <laughs> Here's a story, and, 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 and this has absolutely happened. And it was an on camera commercial for Fritos, Frito Lays. And it was one of those terrible uh, winters in L.A. where the rains were washing out roads and everything. And we were out in Thousand Oaks, out in the hinterlands uh, above L.A. And the commercial was uh, basically a Norman Rockwell painting. Uh, it opened on my hand taking the lid off a Weber barbecue. And in there, of course, why, I don't know, but of course, was a, pa a, a bag of Frito-Lays, che Cheetos. And... Uh, Fritos. So, and, and then the camera widened out, widened out. This guy was a very artistic director. And suddenly there's my wife, there's my kid, there's my dog. In the, I, in the, in the in barbecue? The, they're all yeah, in the barbecue? Oh, the that's really awful. No, I'm just kidding. No, thank you for straightening that out. No, they're, they're in the shot. And the shot widens and widens, and now there's maybe 50 people in the shot. It's a family portrait. And way up in the back, on, on a hill, is a, a swing, a tire swing, with a little girl swinging on it. The director of photography did not show up in the morning. He didn't get there till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We start at 7 a.m. From 7 a.m. until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, this monster that was my kid drove everybody insane. He was the meanest. I could, it was like Damien. He was just terrible. At one point, he took one of the barbecue forks and put it into the hindquarters of the dog. I mean, he was what? not, I mean, he didn't spear him, but he, he heard him. Yarr! And it, <laughs> the thing was taken away from, and it went on and on, and everybody's trying everything. And out on the periphery of all this is his mother saying, Stanley, stop that. That's all she would do. Five hours of Stanley, stop that. The AD is going nuts, the assistant director, because he's in charge. Finally, two o'clock after lunch, the DP shows up. Uh, and, and he was also the, uh, the director of the thing, but he shot it. And he walks up, now we're all reassembled, and uh, the kid, the director says, all right, stand by, I'm gonna call action. And the kid's going, eh, 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 all this, and the director, comes away from the eyepiece, he says, what's, what's with him? And the, uh, everybody said, he's a monster. He's been doing this all day. And the director said the following words. Right, lose him. Uh, give me that little girl up there on the hill. <laughs> and this kid just, I mean, he returned to stone. And the mother's screaming, no! And he was escorted off the set to everyone's applause. The little girl got a round of applause coming down to the center of us. 11 years old, 
and I'll never forget what she said. She looked at the director and said, you'll remember to change my contract from extra to principal, won't you? <laughs> and the director goes, right, let's shoot this. <laughs> so that's the worst thing I've ever seen. And it was really the mom's fault. It wasn't the kid. I mean, the kid was a monster, but she should have taken him in hand. I don't think he's in the business anymore. Much to his mother's, uh, you know, consternation. Oh. <laughs> Stage moms. They are problematic sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and uh, open up to our audience questions. Uh, I'm going to put a microphone up front here for you. Do, do, do. And again, you get, uh, I will ask everybody to please do, if we have a line, please have one question at a time. And again, let's keep it to voice. It would be awesome, too, if we could have it for... All of our guests. So, who wants to go first? All right, this young lady. All right, what's your name? Imani. Imani. Everybody give a round of applause for Imani, our first question here. Okay, well, first of all, I think someone needs to turn Stanley, stop that into a meme now. We all heard it. Someone get the internet on it and make that into a meme. But uh, my question is uh, what kind of advice would you have for, to, what kind of advice would you have for not accidentally blowing out your voice while you're doing your job? It depends. I mean, uh, you do. I mean, experience. Take. I mean, uh, knowing and understanding like, like your instrument, you. as it were. You know, uh, being able to. You know, if you've gone through classes and, and understanding you know, like vocal, uh, uh, you know, warm ups and, and and these kinds of things, you've taken a vocal class from a vocal coach and. Uh, and they'll get you to understand of what really warming up is and, 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 and how to uh, kind of have those things expanded and making sure you're not constricting things with like cold water. I mean, just simple things sometimes. But, uh, and know yourself. I mean, I can go into the booth. I play a lot of loud, screamy characters. And at the end of the day, I, I just kind of know that point. Like, all right, if I don't stop now, tomorrow I can't work. You know? Yeah. So yeah. that, and that's just, it, it just takes some time and some experience, really. I, I would say that if you're gonna, it depends on how much time you're going to spend in the booth. I, I, <clears throat> I do a lot of audio books, and I have a studio at my house, and I will spend six hours in the chair. And it's ugly. It's really long, and it takes a long time, and it's hard. It's grueling. But it is, it's, 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 good. it's good work. But, but at the same time, I've learned that if you're, gonna, uh, if you're, you're doing a lot of vocal uh, fireworks or a lot of long hours, it's best to start with warm liquid, like a warm uh, something on your throat, like throat coat with a little warm. And then as you go progress in the day, a couple hours later, you go cool water. <laughs> with, I put some throat coat in that. You want to cool it down just like, a, like you have to ice, ice a muscle. So <clears throat> you want to loosen it up, warm it up in the day, and then cool it down, almost ice it down as the day goes on, like, like a bruise. Okay. And just do that every day. That's, that's the way I move on. Because cold water, I used to think it was the worst thing you could do. You, sure. you, but, but if you, you start warm and then go cold, it's actually, you're actually... Um, Keeping the inflammation down. To think about sa that. It saves your voice. I guarantee yeah. it saves your voice. Yeah. I'll use it you have do to exercises. breathe. Do exercise. Sit up straight and keep, keep your chin down. You have to breathe diaphragmatically. If you don't, you can't do it. You just can't do it. And I'm not going to go into a demonstration of it, but <laughs> diaphragmatic breathing is the opposite yep. of the way you breathe. It's yep. the way you breathe when you s sleep. It's the way you breathe when you were in mom. In the, in the baby the cries, the baby cries, complete right. with a diaphragm. And just what happens air. is you take air in and you don't fill up your chest. To, you, fill up, you fill up your lungs by expanding your diaphragm. It's not flattering. Women don't like it, but it's, <laughs> it's this. You're expanding your diaphragm and you're sucking air in because if you don't have enough support, even to just do a normal voice, mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna lose it. You're gonna go hoarse before take, the day's take over. Take a voice class. Take a take a voice class. That that most definitely yeah. absolutely. And uh, go into it. If you if you get an audition, to audition for a character role or something this way, before you start throwing the voices <laughs> out, think to yourself. Can I sustain this for four Can hours? Can I maintain it? Can I do this? Because you, you could go, blah, 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 I will destroy you, Batman. Blah. And then, oh, great, we love it. You got the part. And now you've got to do 22 pages of copy. <laughs> and you're going to last about 10 minutes. When we first started the Monsters, Inc. Uh, Laugh Floor show, our first month, Imagineering had us doing all kinds of really crazy, crazy voices. Within four weeks, half the cast was on vocal rest. Sure. Because they just blew ourselves out and everything they had to pull back and go low tame. So, just like it, hydrate, know your know your limits, and stick within that. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. 
And I think the good directors will, will uh, if they know they're screaming, yes. they'll do that last. No now, doubt. They'll, they'll no wait doubt. for the, and now it's the end of the day, and if you blow your voice out, that's your problem. Go home. <laughs> you can go home. But they save the screaming for the end. That's a smart director. Hey. Hi. Um, so at the beginning of most of your talks, you all talked about how you really started in some of like the famous places for voice acting, Burbank and Texas and places like that. Um, do any of you have any advice for people who live in Florida or want to try work online? I don't know if either of you have worked with people who've started their careers that way. I don't know. I don't know anybody. There, there are online resources. Well, it depends. Um, there are online resources where people have their own like sizzle reels and audition and things out there. Mm -hmm. That's. I have a good friend of mine that actually booked a fair amount of work. Uh, none of it is United States. He, okay. he does uh, work for a Peru he does a Peruvian cartoon, an American character on that. Oh. Um, but I'm a big believer in in make make your own luck. You know, I always say get together a uh, full sale in Orlando and okay. might be, find a find animators, find guys studying animation, computer animation, and knock on doors and be all like, hey, if you're doing a project, uh, I, can I do a voice on it? Because as your career goes and their career goes, I always say everybody look at the uh, Scorsese and De Niro partnership. You know, okay. that's 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 something I would look for, and I would say. By all means, make your own luck. Try to create your own stuff Fair. and get it out there. Okay. You have you have technology at home. You have YouTube. You've got way more stuff than any of us had even ten years ago. Fair enough. My opinion is you got to go to Mecca. <laughs> you just got to go to Mecca. I mean, uh, it, it, it's okay to do all these things. I, I think he's absolutely right. But at some point, you're going to have to go where the work is. And f I realize for games, it could be in Dallas. That great company in Dallas, or there's, there, but if you really want to get representation, and then you, you get your stripes, you know, you start working, and then at some point you get a, 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 a handful of success, and your agent really loves you and wants to book you, you can say, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm moving back to, uh, my case, Petaluma, north of San Francisco. I have a studio there, so I can work out of there, but I'm a known, I'm a known entity, mm -hmm. and, and but if you're not, because you didn't get recognized in L.A. or in New York, then it's, it's pretty hard to establish yourself out in the hustings. All right. I'll say even though for, for anime especially, you know, there, you're not going to be able to do anime remotely uh, for the most part. I mean, some people do. I mean, like a Sean Schimmel will because he's out in L.A. And, you know, they, they'll take the time to, to make those connections with other Source yeah. Connect and other studios. But uh, he's, again, a known entity where they're willing to do those kinds of things. But for the most part, you're going to exactly have to go where the work is. Makes sense. No doubt. You will have to move. Okay. Period. Right. Well, uh, thank you guys very much. Thank right. you. Okay. Good luck with the traffic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, he can handle the heat. He can handle the traffic. Yeah. Um, my question to you all is, um, when you're doing uh, anime versus like original animation, how is the process of you like coming up with the character, the voice, like the mannerisms for the character, like maybe a take or maybe something w that you do specifically with the mouth? How is that process different from anime? that? We can't and... tell you. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's a mystery. Ah. Uh, no, no, we just can't tell them. I'm with you. The next thing you know, he's working. Oh Our yeah, jobs. I already That's am. True. Uh, hmm. <laughs> No, basically, I mean, with anime, uh, having those visuals there really does kind of give you a lot as an actor. You know, I come from that world of improv, you know, and little bits of information can really go a long way when building a character, you know. And it's something you just got to commit to and sell and, and go for it. You know, this, I'm making this choice, I'm going with this choice, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in the world of, uh, uh, you know, um, say like for me, it's video games. For the, some of these guys, it's more of the, uh, the, more of the mainstream uh, cartoons where they're getting together in groups and acting together and playing off each other, you know, oh, Explain anime. that. This is something you should know if, about well, like ensemble work. Well, ensemble work, I mean, it's a completely different thing because you are playing off of each other. In anime, we'd record individually one at a time, and you hope that maybe someone else previously recorded that you can play off of, uh, but it it's a, does become a See, completely I think that's what's process. cool about anime is it sounds a little disjointed. I think that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I think well, that's with, what makes it different. We have a lot of great weird directors weird. And, and, and good actors out there that, you know, and somehow at the end it does really all kind of come together. But it is, but it really does take games, a good director with whether Video games are the same way. You're a solo artist. Yes. And if you think about it, of course you'd have to be because you walk in and, and maybe you're in a, 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 a cut piece or something like that. But once you start playing the game with the player, you have to have answers 
for all of his actions. And those, those permutations are stacked like this. Oh my God, are and, they? And you have to go through them and through them. You can't, I mean, you can't do an ensemble because you never know what the player is gonna do. So animation is really the only ensemble. Uh, by ensemble, I mean you go into a nice room at Disney. There's sort of a, a, a chamber music chairs and a little green light on your stand. It's very civilized. And you do play off each other, but, but that, that all goes away when... Uh, and what's even it. more different than, than the anime where you're doing it in little pieces is overdubbing, which I, I, the Sephiroth that I did was overdubbing the Japanese voice. So I had to actually time his voice. You know, he would go, I, 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 Oh, God, I hate that. And I would have to go, I will kill you, Cloud. I have to, like, things that have to be right. sort of... You know, where you're no longer your matching a flap, thick. you're matching a length of time. I have to match a length of time and almost sometimes an intonation of something. And I don't know what the hell... I mean, Japanese, clearly, it's, there's the subtlety of whatever Japanese acting. I just literally have to match, in his voice, the timing of it. So, again, it sounds weird, but then it becomes its own signature weird sound. So, Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, as technology gets more and more advanced, would there be any more ensemble, you know, group, you know, acting? Like, I feel like there's less of that now with behind the scenes, just people in the booth now. Is, is the technology going so fast, we can just do it in our, our bedrooms and we just, in our pajamas, do voice <laughs> acting? Yeah, I think there's a lot of that, but I mean, I think ideally they like to get people together to get reactions and sort of... Yeah. That they still do a fair amount of that, as far as I know. I mean, I tell you what, an act, what an actor loves is to be able to look another actor in the eye and play off the thing that they're giving them, and then you give something back. This back and forth really is, is really crucial. It's what an actor desires, you know? So when you do kind of find yourself in that, in that booth by yourself, you know, you have these, you, you, you have to have had this experience with other actors and this time and stage, and, and all these ex experiences accumulate into this moment where I'm now kind of on my own, and I've got to kind of place myself in that world uh, and with, with the anime, like I said, it's great because it's really right there for you. All the information there you need is right there before you. But uh, and you get to crack each other up. You get to break the tension. You know, it's it's kind of like being in school. Uh, Frank Welker, who, in my opinion, is is the greatest voice actor in the universe, Frank Welker, and uh, he was on Ducktales and Darkwing, and he would sit kind of behind me at his microphone. And we'd get ready to record, and he can do any voice. He also does sounds. Mm -hmm. One of his great tricks was to do a styrofoam cup leaking. <laughs> no, I can't do no, it for I mean, you. It's unbelievable. It, it, it's he, unbelievable. He's, a, he's a freak and the sweetest guy in the world. But he would sit behind me, and he did, uh, some of you may be too young to, there's this actor, was an actor named Gregory Peck. <laughs> and he had a very deep, Gregory Peck. deep, deep <laughs> voice. And he would sit behind me, and we'd get ready to go, and I'd, suddenly I'd hear, Terry, how are you? And for some reason or other, I dissolved. Every time he did it, I was on the floor. <laughs> Have you seen Scout? And finally, <laughs> Andrea Romano, the director, says, I'm going to have to separate you two, just like being in school. So that kind of esprit, you know, that, 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 that fun of being with other actors is, is I think, wonderful. And... It doesn't exist in, uh, in the other form. One thing I've noticed over the past couple of years is that uh, people are starting to do uh, internet radio shows again. Comedy, dramatic, uh, narrative-based, uh, sometimes goopy stuff. So that's, that's, starting, that's starting to come back. So form, form your own group. So maybe like a, a, you know, like a, like a podcast, everyone's online, we just talk to each other? Sometimes, sometimes I've, I've, I've heard two versions. Sometimes they're doing it remotely in their own locations, and then I've heard they're doing it in somebody's garage with a bunch of microphones up, yeah. stuff like that. No, so. but, but he, his question was that everybody is, uh, who's online is contributing to the... No, we're talking about a group of people providing the entertainment listened to by people online. Yeah, uh, that's what the ensemble is. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, so over across all the different roles that you guys have done, what would you say would be some of the favorite lines that you've ever had to say? Like ones that you just found so memorable and so enjoyable that sometimes maybe people might ask you to do them and all that. How about these aren't the droids you're looking for? Move along. <laughs> that was me. I want you to get on your really? knees and yeah. beg for forgiveness. <laughs> 
Sorry, I'm having a fanboy moment here for a second. <laughs> you were the stormtrooper? I yeah. lived in San Anselmo at the time. So, so, so does George Lucas. And, and he asked a bunch of San Francisco voice actors to come over to his house, to his, uh, to his uh, uh, screening room. And, uh, you know, at this point, you have to understand, George had done two films. THX 1138, I did voices on that, and I got to play the school teacher in American Graffiti. So this is his third film, but he's not a household word. He's just little George, who was doing very well. And uh, we went there and we said, George, what, what do you want from us? Well, I need some post-production voices. Uh, they sort of background voices. Okay, fine, what's the movie? He said, well, it's called Star Wars. Ah, Star Wars, there's a nice name. Uh, and what, what's it about? And he said, well, it's kind of an outer space. And he's not a guy who talks much. And he was kind of stumbling. And finally he said, I'll show you something. And we all got quiet and the lights went down in the screening room. And he showed us the Death Star exploding. And the lights came back up. And we said, that's it? He said, that's all I can show you. <laughs> so he said, you're going to be basically like stormtroopers, uh, military policemen. And I said, okay, fine. So there was a stack of scripts, and everybody in time, before we were finished, read the same script. It was a round robin, you know, and then it switch, and Ben, uh, ben uh, Burt, the sound man who won 21 Academy Awards for him, was there with a little nagra, and, okay, you read this one. So this is 75, 77, I'm living in L.A., and I go to see the movie with a friend, and uh, I said, you know, I... You probably hear my voice in this little space movie you're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, bam, it comes on, John Williams. And I said, what the hell is this? What is going on? And then I hear my voice say, and you guys can, don't, please don't applaud. There they go, blast them. That was, am that was amazing. Sorry. That was amazing. <laughs> so I was prepared for that. And then the scene at Moss Eisley, there'll be one who comes up and says, these aren't the droids you're looking for. And I say, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Move along. And I scream. <laughs> In the theater. Scream. That's me! <laughs> yeah. Never, I still can't get over it. You're the coolest dude I know. <laughs> I just want to say that. <laughs> that is so cool. Your favorite line. Oh, my favorite line? Oh, man. Uh, you know, Hercule was kind of iconic in his light shows and tricks and all of that. Uh, but honestly, I had a line in Borderlands 2 as Mr. Torg uh, that I thought was funny. I thought it was funnier than it really was. I, I thought the line was, now go punch a bad guy in the dick. <laughs> what, when I listened to it in the video game, I don't remember recording the line. I literally I recorded many of those lines for the one time and one time only. Uh, and so I didn't remember every single line. But when I was playing the game one time, I hear it and I was like, and I think he said, I thought he said this. And I'll do it in Mr. Torg's voice. I think he said, uh, now go punch a fat guy in the dick. <laughs> And I just thought, man, that's hilarious, right? And I was like, oh, you should oh, hear that. And then the writer, I was at a convention one time, the writer, I was telling the story, and the writer goes, that's not what you say. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? He's like, it's just bad guy. I'm like, well, mine's funnier. <laughs> We're putting that in. Let's just let me tell the story that way. Get out of my story. Yeah, right. 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 Don't change my fake story. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hello. So I know Terry kind of talked about this earlier, um, but what were your guys' inspirations for like some of the more iconic roles that you had? Like Chris, what was the inspiration behind the voice of Hercule, I guess? Uh, Hulk Hogan and 80s wrestlers that wrestled with him and during that time. So people like Macho Man Savage, Jesse the Body Ventura. In my head, Mr. Satan was always cutting a wrestling promo. You know, <laughs> at any moment, he'd just be like, all right, let me tell you, Mean Gene, you know, I mean, just ready to snatch a microphone and tell the story and make himself look really good. Uh, I think Superman for me was just uh, my brother, who's my older brother. Was, uh, uh, he's a, now an orthopedic surgeon, but he was an Eagle Scout, and I just thought everything, Superman's pretty black and white kind of guy, and 
you know, right and wrong, and I just had to channel my brother the whole time, just be very earnest, and everybody's got to do the right thing, and I'm about to get electrocuted. Shit! Ah! Always! <laughs> but um, Superman seemed to get electrocuted all the time, which I hate. It's really hard to be, it kills the voice. Anyway. Uh, yeah, all right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Voice acting is something I've always admired, and it's something I've also wanted to possibly get into, if even just as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I know that practicing is a big thing. I always hear, you got to practice, you got to practice. But what exactly would be a good way to practice, and what is a good way to get into it more exactly? Well, I think to kind of emphasize what we, where we started with this is really go out there, find a group of people who have that sort of like-mindedness and start creating things together. You know, what, one of my great best pieces of advice I ever got from an acting teacher of mine, he's like, you want to be an actor? Go act. Call yourself an actor and start acting. Call yourself right? an actor. Get and used to telling yourself that. Get right. into a class. Get into a class and get with people, like-minded people, and do, yeah. do some plays. Class is, the way class is the way to go. No doubt. No doubt. If there are some schools or workshops or, you know, your community colleges and stuff like that have really great theater programs that get probably underfunded and underloved. But, uh, I mean, there's a really a lot, uh, there's just a lot of it out there. And so just start looking for it. Get involved. Uh, get on your feet and start acting. Imita imitate voices. You hear voices you yes. like. You know, I like to hear. I don't like to do cultural appropriation, yes, but steal. I do hear it. And it, it sounds good to me. And I'm like, I love the, just the sound the of voices. Voice. I love yeah. the best advice yet. Advice yet. Yeah. Do I? Yeah. Steal. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, okay. Um, no, the, George's advice is great, especially if you want to do what you apparently want to do, which is animated voices, video game voices. You have to change your voice. To the point. Have you ever done an impression for a friend and, and they say, boy, that's really good. That doesn't even sound like you. And that's what you have to be able to do with your voice, is to change it. Change the placement, change the, the overall sound of it, and you do it's that the by... It's that makes you giggle. It's the things that carbonates you. The thing that it kind of excites you. You go, God, yeah. I love that voice. Try to imitate that voice. Practice it. Uh, imitate it. And maybe it's not going to be awesome immediately, but, but eventually... Find one that you really feel like you can do well, and you'll get excited, and it'll lead you to other voices. And you, know, and you, you will go. find that you will be called probably insane. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I would do that. You know, I'd Same. be at home, and I would be riding in a Type. car, Same. and then you suddenly go, what? No, I was just... Uh, yeah. <laughs> always, always. Because you're playing all the time. All the time. You're constantly playing. And then if you have another a buddy who does voices, I have a friend who does Christopher Walken as well as anybody. Hey, I mean, I can't do it. Every time I try to do it, I become inhibited because I know how good his is. But every time I'm with him, I ask, show me how you do that again. Terry, uh, and he does it. And I, I still have him. And so it's a challenge, and it ne you never get... Challenge. <laughs> you never get to 100%. You never get an You know, Terry, it's, right. it's a good time. It's a good time. <laughs> We've all had here. This watch. <laughs> I carry this watch. Kept this uncomfortable hunk of metal in his ass. Wow. <laughs> for two years. Wait See what minute. happens? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and then Sorry. it becomes competitive. Until he yeah. died of dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> I wore this watch. <laughs> My Sorry. Beautiful and now I give it to you. Little man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone's movie. got a walking voice. We have to hope you know the rest of those lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, one bit of advice that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, some of our panels, somebody said, but I thought was really good, was uh, read out loud. Yeah. Get, a, find, get, a, get yourself in a quiet room. Don't do it in public. People can look at you weird. But uh, get a book, newspaper, whatever, and read it out loud. Get used to chewing a lot of words, and then we get come. We need to find a pattern and change up the tempo, and then start experimenting, giving characters voices and stuff like that. Which in audiobooks, I know that's one of the hardest. Gigs. I had 167 characters in the last book I did. Wow! I mean, yeah, it was ridiculous, and it's science fiction. I have no idea what anyone's supposed to sound like, so you're just assigning. You can't go so nuts with the voices, so you don't. You want to be so jarring, but you do. You have to learn and how to differentiate different characters. For God's sake, learn Shakespeare. Every actor should have two monologues 
in her pockets or, you know, he or she. B because you never know when you're going to get called to an audition. You have one modern monologue, something, maybe a, a light comedy. You don't want to have too much tragic, you know, heavy drama. And in your other pocket, you've got a Shakespeare monologue. For God's sake, the American actors, for the most part, my experience, are terrified of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is easy. There's nothing to it. It's the easiest <laughs> thing in the world. You just learn it and he, say it. Shakespeare literally gives you everything right there. Yeah. It's all right there on the page. And you can't, you can't play with it like you do with, with modern writing. And modern do you, do you writing have, is, what is your Shakespeare monologue on hand? What do you got? <laughs> don't, no, uh, don't do okay, it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that these players here, but in, in a fiction, fiction, but in a dream of passion, could force their souls so to their own conceit that in her working, all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction and suspect, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. And what's he to Hecuba or Hecuba to him that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the cue or motive for passion Good that job. I have? He would drown the stage with horrid speech, make man the guilty and appall the free, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Where am I? <laughs> oh, man. Make some noise for that. It's called acting, folks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. And unfortunately, we are just about at time, so we will take out this, uh, this last question from my friend Christian. I'm sorry, I didn't bring a Shakespeare play. I didn't know that's what was part of right. the requirements there. It's all good. Gentlemen, my name's Christian, and I've been doing radio shows, podcast plays, everything for about seven years now. One of the, thing, the strongest things I've had to challenge with, even now, I've been talking to you, is when I audition or do anything, even when I go live on a show, because we do everything in one take, is how do you suppress the demons? How do you make those things go away so they're not coming up and inflecting in your voice? Did I just say a bad word? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you did. <laughs> when you get nervous, yeah, no. Yeah. Like now. <laughs> Bre you know, so breath. How do you breath. breath. Yeah, I, breath. Take, I do take a breath before every show, pause for a second and go on. But what do you guys do before you go up there? It's and not a breath. It's, it's breathing. It's, breathing. An aware, okay. it's an awareness yeah. of your breath. Okay. And it's how it's moving through your body. How how fast it's moving. I mean, emotion is connected to breath, you know? I mean, so the, you know, the angrier we get, you know, the breath, the breath picks up and you get a little angry, right? And you feel sorrow, the, you know, it's all, it's all in that breath, you know? So breathing will take you where you need to go. And just stay you in know? it. Don't, just, go, just lean into aware it. Lean into it. Don't, don't, don't retreat. When you retreat from it, you get more nervous. When you breathe and lean in, stay in, stay in, stay in, you, you, you'll find. Microphone. <laughs> Microphone. Oh. <laughs> clearly the oldest. Mic check. Clearly, <laughs> clearly right. the eldest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the breathing will, is actually medicinal, if you want yeah. to call it. You have to keep doing it. Oh, I'm getting scared. I'm getting, things are building up. Keep filling up the diaphragm. Keep filling up the diaphragm. Exhale. And it will calm your nerves. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank right you. Here. What I wanted to ask is, uh, any social media outlets that you guys have, and do you have any upcoming projects that you're allowed to share with us? Uh, check me out on Twitter, at Rager Coaster. Uh, September uh, Borderlands 3 comes out. Uh, so, uh, wow, great. that might be in there somewhere. Uh, and then, uh, actually, I would like to say this. Joel McDonald, who directed that, said, Chris, you've recorded on this game more than anyone. And I was like, do I get a trophy? And I, <laughs> and I don't, apparently. So. No, at George Sorry. Newbern Twitter, uh, I don't know. I probably, hopefully, I'll have a job next week. I have no idea. I don't know what's happening to me. I just we'll I write take it all in when, tomorrow. When, when's, the, when's the audiobook come out? Do you know? I, I've done 320, so I've, right, I'm in the yes. middle of three books right now, so I don't know. What? Yeah, I, I just, listen, I, the great thing about audiobooks is I don't need to have an agent. I just talk to publishers, and I go and I do my work. I get to do voices, and I just have a strong vocal cords, and I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Wow. Uh, but then, then when I get an, an animated thing or an on-camera thing, I go do that. But my day-to-day yeah. -day job is audiobook stuff, so it's a whole, it's a completely different And you do it at home? I do it at home. I do it at uh, home. Sweet. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Sweet. I'm, a, I'm a Terry McDuck on Instagram and Terrence Sean. 
T-E-R-E-N-C-E-S-E-A-N -E 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 uh, uh, on Twitter. Supercon 2019, this was Terry McGovern, George Newbern, and Thank Chris you. Frazier, and that was our time. They are going to be at their tables for the rest table of the weekend. Table 34. Table 34. Yeah, exactly. Please come on by, grab a picture, grab an See autograph, say hi, and don't forget, smiles are always free. Thank you, Supercon. Yay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Come on down. See us at the tables. Thank you. <laughs>